Biggie oh, Small yeah. and Mansions and Benzes. <laughs> I never listened to Biggie much. I mean, being a West Coast resident, I feel like listen to him a lot, actually. Yeah, I feel like that the West Coast, like you guys embrace biggie and a little bit more of the east coast as opposed to in the opposite end of it the whole west coast east coast war from my angle in florida felt like that the east coast didn't represent or uh, respect uh, tupac or other people like dre snoop cube whatever um and so i just i don't know i just kind of felt that way like that that was one of the things where you guys embrace biggie more and he was more widely accepted whereas tupac yeah it was like Hit or miss, depending on where you're at. I can see that. I can see that because um, you, even though you were in Florida, you really embraced Tupac. Yeah. And I know more Biggie songs than you do. Yeah, for sure. So I can totally understand that. Yeah. Um, that said, it sounds like a great episode for your Nice and Toasted podcast. <laughs> what, a breakdown of the Tupac and uh, Biggie East Coast, West Coast War? Maybe. Something like that. Yeah. You get somebody who's really into hip hop and can really talk to you about it. I think that'd be a good episode. Yeah, sure. There might be still some conspiracy theorists out there that think that Tupac's alive and hanging out in Cuba or something like that. But like, why would he? <laughs> <laughs> like, the, yeah, he would live longer, but quality of life, man. It's all about quality of life. And it seemed like he liked the limelight. So why would he? Right. I mean, but then people like Chappelle, for example, have also walked away from the limelight entirely, even though they seem to enjoy and embrace it. Right. Um, but also, I, I feel based on what um, I know about that whole um, his his walk, Chappelle's walking away. Um, I feel a lot of it is also feeling disrespected within the industry. Sure. And, and feeling taken advantage of. And right. that's completely different than turf wars. Turf wars, yeah. Non-existent actual turf wars. <laughs> yeah. No, I get you. I Made up you. by, you know, Puff Daddy, who is the reason we had the 2008 recession. <laughs> I go into a whole theory about that. That's a whole another conspiracy theory there. Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe we could dive into that sometime. Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, it's Heidi and Stefan. Welcome back to the Ice Cream Parlor. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, we're back again coming at you with another episode. Guess who's back in the motherfucking house? With a fat dude for your motherfucking mouth. Oh, no, thanks. Uh, I'm vegan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, but no, thank you. Sausage is not my thing. Yeah, that's a great song, though. It ain't no fun if the homies can't have none. I mean, that's... Opens up a whole other can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a the song 90s. of the times, definitely. Yeah. Back in the times where people didn't respect women as much as they pretend to now. Sure. Which is a whole other conversation. Yeah. Anyway, today we're talking about Orphan from 2009. I had seen it before. So when we watched it again this time, I was kind of like, all right, this will be cool. I kind of remember little bits and pieces of it. Uh, but I forgot that Vera Farmiga was the actress who played. Yeah, and she's an amazing actress. Yeah. And she always seems to be in movies where there's like she's good in a horror movie. Her eyes always look like she's about to cry. Yeah, she she actually, I think, is in like the most movies in this like genre or something like that. Like she's been in the most like evil child movies. Yeah, Someone yeah. Did their Between this and the Conjuring and that other one that I, you told me about that was like the Orphan, Joshua. Joshua, yeah. Um, interesting enough, I first kind of came across her in The Departed because she plays this. Oh, that's uh, right. You told me that. Yeah, she yeah. plays Matt Damon's. Uh, no, not Matt Damon. Is it Damon? I yeah, don't yeah, yeah, Damon. Know. I've yeah. never seen the Departed. Or Affleck. I can't remember which. No, Matt Damon. He she plays his like love interest and in whatever. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I thought she was good in that role, and she seems to be good in every movie that I've ever seen her in. So. Yeah, I, I think Orphan was the first thing I remember seeing her in. I have seen Orphan before, and I really enjoyed it. So I saw that it was next on our list, and I thought, let's do this thing because yeah. I like that movie. However, I didn't want to pay for it. Right, so and I tell them. it wasn't on Netflix. So, so how'd you get it? 
I ordered it on a DVD through Netflix. The old Netflix DVD to, yes. to mail to D- yes. uh, mail it so to So when house. I return this one, I get They still do that? Yeah, it's it's a part you have to go into your settings. You have to add an extra three dollars a month or something like that. But it redirects you to DVD.com. So do you get a wider selection than what's already on? Yes. Generally speaking, you do. Yeah. And that's why I like it because I do get movies that I can't find for free or included with my subscriptions for anything else I have because I have a lot of subscriptions. I don't want to necessarily have to pay to watch a movie when I have all of these options available to me. Sure. But when there's something I really do want to watch, I'm going to um, just order it. I think after I reach an orphan, I think the next movie I get is Mama, Mama, which I'm also looking forward to. Oh, okay. I, I think one might be on streaming, but again, my list, I put my list together a long time ago. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That one would be interesting. Um, I actually, I think I subscribed to the DVDs again when I was trying to get you to watch the original Suspiria. Oh, right. Okay. I gotcha. Cause we couldn't find it anywhere else. Right. So yeah, sure. Right. Um, yeah. That's cool. I the mama ones, I always get them confused because there's like three or four different movies Mother, that are yeah. Ma, mama, mama's house. I don't know. Big Mama's <laughs> House. That's with Martin, right? Is that Big Mama's House? Yeah, maybe. maybe. Or is that it's a guy in, in dressed as a as a grandma. Or I think it's right? Martin, Big Mama's house. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. It's like a Mrs. Doubtfire or something yes. like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't remember, um, but I think you're right. Yeah. Um, but not as kid-friendly. Yeah. So the orphan. I never watched those. Anyway, um, orphan. What do you know about orphans? I That's a sad case. They don't have parents. Yeah. That's did, what I know about orphans. Okay. Uh, me too. Did you ever know anybody who was an orphan growing up? Not growing up, but I I have a cousin who's an orphan. Okay. Um, his mother died while she was giving birth. And this is back in El Salvador. So she died giving birth. And then his dad, my uncle, passed not too long ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that seems tough because that's more of like. Where's your foundation? Right. You you had. You, you, it's not that your parents were abusive or hated you. You just sort of like, you know, didn't get to know them at all. Yeah. Um, that's, that's pretty crazy. I don't know if I never knew, if I ever knew anybody who was like an orphan. I know um, a lot of people whose parents abandoned them and left them to be raised by their grandparents, but not exactly orphans. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know a few people like that. Um, but yeah. So I think it, that is one of the most like, so you brought this to light to me when we were talking about this movie, which I didn't know, is that people who foster kids get paid to do it. It's like a paycheck. And then I realized that's a whole nother thing now. Some people will just take kids in just to do get a, you know a, a little bit of money, or whatever. Um, yeah, I think I talked to you about that, that on the on last, the last episode. episode. Yeah, yeah. So you do get some money from the government or from the state when you um, foster children, but a lot of people do it that way as a kind of like a gateway to being able to adopt. Right. Right. So in this scenario in the movie, it's more of an adoption case or something like that or what? I don't know. So in this movie, um, oh, well, we'll go, so. Sorry, sorry. I know I always jump ahead. It's sorry. Right, so, sorry. Okay, well, let's so, take it back a few. All right. Well, sorry. Orphan came right. out in 2009. Sure. Yeah. And is directed by Jaume Colesera. I don't know. Whoa. Some man and or woman. Um, and it stars Vera Vera, Vera Farmiga. Yeah. Um, Peter Sarsgaard. Right, and he's uh, he's one the of dad. The, yeah, he's the dad in the movie. Uh, he's a Sarsgaard. Right, Skarsgård. he's one of those. Is he a brother or something? Yeah, yeah. and then um, Isabel Furman, and Ooh. she plays little orphan Esther. Esther. <laughs> yeah, little orphan Esther. Esther. So the movie is so the movie is about a family who brings in. An orphan into their family. They adopt her, full on adopt her, not sure. foster, full on adopt her, and shit gets crazy. Sure, yeah, right. and and this is all after the fact that there was an incident before, like leading up to this, right? Did they lose a child or something? Or there right. Was so accident? let's get into it. Okay. Um. So Vera is married to Peter. Yeah. They have names. I don't remember them. Yeah. Maybe I can find them. Hold on. I'm sure they have names. <laughs> we we never remember the people's names. We're always like, oh well, it's Sandra Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So then John Travolta says, all right. <laughs> so <laughs> Vera is um, plays Kate, who's okay. the mother. Kate. Peter plays John, who's the father. And Isabel Furman plays Esther, Esther. who is the orphan. Right. All right. So I was going to say, so Vera and Peter. <laughs> so Kate and John, <laughs> um, they have two children already. Mm-hmm. And the movie actually opens with Vera going to the hospital to give birth to their third child. Right. Yes. Right. And it's, yes. and it's a very sad scene. Because it turns out, and we find out throughout the movie, well, we find out in the beginning of the movie that she loses the baby. Yeah. But what we didn't know until later in the movie is that the baby has been dead inside of her for 17 days. And she gave birth to a dead baby. Right. She had a stillborn, stillborn. child. Yeah. Um, and apparently there were like phantom movements and stuff, which is kind of like when you lose a, a limb and you still feel the pain in that limb, even though it's not there. Sure. Same kind of thing. Okay. Um, so it's a very sad and kind of trippy opening scene because the, the doctor is also her husband, but not really. It's just in that dream. Right. It, it was for yeah. a moment. It was very believable. Like I thought this was really the birth scene and then it hits you and you're like, Oh, this is a dream sequence mm-hmm. of some sorts or whatever. Um, but so she wakes up and we find out, yes, it's a dream, but she did, in fact, lose a child, lose a child. Yeah. She's got and the scar and everything. She has a, she yeah. has um, the cesarean uh, scar on her stomach and she's still distant from her husband. Yeah. In fact, later in the movie, we find that they um, had cremated the baby. They were going to name oh, Jessica right. and they planted her ashes in a in um, a rose bush. And so this rose is growing this rose bush is going growing out of the ashes. So the as long as the plant is alive, baby Jessica is alive. Right, yeah. But if you've seen how high as many times as I have, you see that and you giggle. Oh, because of the the ivory. Plant? Ivory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever um well, when I was a kid, we had a guinea pig, and when it died, we buried it under a tree, and that tree was like a grapefruit tree or something, and it actually bore big fruit, if that makes hairy? any sense. <laughs> big, hairy fruit. No, I mean... Um, have you seen, like, when hamsters have, like, these huge balls? What do you mean? Like, hair balls? Like, their Shedding? testicles? Oh, oh, yeah. Like, Isn't that insane? <laughs> they have, like, the biggest nuts ever. Yeah. Those are some ballsy motherfuckers. I didn't know you were into looking at rodent balls. Well, so when <laughs> when my kids were little, we had a hairless guinea pig. His name was Hank. And I thought he was broken one day because he had these massive balls that were dragging. And they were bigger than almost his body. <laughs> and know, we were like, oh, my God, he has a tumor. But no, we Googled it and it's just they have big nuts. You didn't think he was like. Male? <laughs> no, I'm saying like you said he had a problem, but like he didn't have any hair. Wasn't that a problem? <laughs> A hairless guinea pig. I mean, that would have been... He was hypoallergenic. A, he was I, so cute. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you're into that sort of thing, sure. I was... I, I mean, I had two guinea pigs growing up and a, a rabbit. So it was some of my first pets. We always had dogs growing up. Yeah. And we had a cat that was never that lived out of the house. Uh, we never had inside animals growing up. Um, even our dogs were outside dogs. Yeah. Um, all that changed when I had kids. So we have a cat that lives inside... We had had Hank, and now we have two dogs inside, gotcha. and they're only inside dogs. Yeah, we were we were in the beginning like only a fish tank kind of family, and then we added like a couple of guinea pigs and a rabbit somehow, um, and we we had fucking some farm animals because we had a giant fucking lot. My dad had this little barn house in the back, but those ones don't count like turkeys and and goats and shit. Right, like that. they don't count as pets, but. <laughs> I, hey, I'm brown. We had chickens yeah. in South Central. Right. <laughs> we had chickens. Um, my sister is a huge animal lover. Um, you can actually follow her on Instagram at Amigo and Oso. And it's just her dogs. Like she is a huge animal lover. And so she, we, we had chickens. We had like, I don't know, at least 20 dogs that came in and out of, of the household. And um I don't know. We didn't have rabbits, but she has rabbits now. She had ducks. She had, you know, all those things. But um, my grandmother's house in Palm Springs, she had chickens and turtles and and geese and turkeys and, you know, all kinds of things. Um, I'm not that much into animals. Like, I love animals and 
I'll pet a lamb all day, but it's I don't want to have to pick up its poop. Right, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, well, we we had moved from Massachusetts down to Florida, and at that time we we brought the guinea pig, one of the guinea pigs. I think I had three total. This was the third out of all of them. The other two had passed on or died, whatever. I can't remember. Uh, one of them got eaten by a cat. Of the smallest one, unfortunately, we used to let him out. As crazy, oh, right. yeah, as crazy as it sounds, we used to let him out of the cage and let him go outside. And they would go outside and just hang out right on the rim of the house, eat grass, do whatever. And if they got scared, they'd run back inside and go in their cage. So they never ran away. But one day we had him out, and a cat was fucking on the prowl, and it just got a hold of the little one. We mm-hmm. call, we called it Penny. Uh, it was like a black and white, straight haired, short hair. Uh, guinea pig uh it's so sad <laughs> yeah it was a little it was a little sad that was my first uh, time losing a pet and whatever but uh i didn't see it happen so it wasn't as traumatic like i didn't watch mm-hmm. it get eaten i my, it happened my uncle or somebody was around and they couldn't unfortunately couldn't stop it uh until it was too late but um, anyways, the one that I moved to Florida with that I was trying to tell you about, it it was it was kind of old already, and I don't know if maybe some of the Florida heat and the change of weather and everything had affected it a little bit, but it, it died very soon after we had moved to this house in Florida, and we were still you know doing things in the yard and whatever. My dad was planting trees, and we had a grapefruit tree, and he buried it under the grapefruit tree, mm. and that grapefruit tree grew big and <laughs> gave a lot of fruit over the years. So I don't know. Um, the whole, uh, in the movie, they do a whole shrine with the ashes and burning and all that kind of thing, which I don't know, like, no, they didn't do the burning, but she was cremated. Cremated. Well, that's what but I mean. It was a, it was a, it was a person. <laughs> I know it was a person, yeah, but it's still, it's weird that, um, you know, you're yeah. keeping somebody's ashes. I, I didn't I have, um, a pet die really growing up. Uh, when we moved into, you know, when my family moved from an apartment we shared with other people into our own home, uh, we did have a dog. We, his name was Brown Socks because Brown Socks because we were very creative. He had brown socks. That was his name. Brown Socks. Brown Come Socks. Here. <laughs> I, I his he he probably came with a different name, but we called him Brown Socks because we had a cat named White Socks. Oh, okay. White <laughs> Socks and Brown Socks. Yeah. So, but I remember my my mom telling us that the neighbor poisoned the dog. Because he died. But we hadn't, we didn't have him long enough to be like traumatized by it. Sure. Yeah. Right. Um, But anyway, yeah. I, her having this shrine to her daughter is, um, is really sad. And when she shows it, it's super emotional. Right. I mean, I had a second trimester miscarriage and it's horrible right like it is really bad yeah i can't imagine yeah and i can't imagine thinking you're going to deliver a child and then bring the child home yeah you know what i mean i i i I, at the very well it's all relative right but at least i didn't have you know a baby shower and a home ready for a child to come and and all those i i was still you know, right. I understand. Working on it. So yeah. To speak. Yeah. So it, it, it's unbelievably sad. And that's why it's very surprising that in this story, Vera and her husband, John, are trying to are, are already trying to adopt a child. Yeah. I was kind of like say, a replacement like, child because the, they already have Max, which is a little girl who is deaf. Right. And they have what's the boy's name? Uh, something like Kevin or something like that. I don't know. Douchey McDouchington, because he was kind um, of rude. But his name is Daniel. Daniel, right? Yeah. yeah uh, yeah. the son Daniel, who is I don't know, like twelve or something, and then Max is like three. I'm um, three, like five, yeah. and they keep asking, and she asks if she's gonna have her, if she's gonna get a different sister. So yeah, it's weird that again they're moving on so quickly, trying to use just a right. replacement, and it's not like they're. I mean, I, I, they're adopting, so it's obviously an you know an. Well, they don't know they're adopting Esther yet, but she's not like a young, young girl. Or right. A, a so they're child. adopting a nine year old. So everybody processes grief differently. Um, and I get that. But she's definitely still in the grieving process. So for her to automatically want to replace baby Jessica yes. with not it's just strange. another child, but an, uh, a nine year old child right. is um, is very interesting to me um, because. 
she finds a child that is like halfway in between her two existing children yeah. when Jessica would have been baby number three. Yeah. But, she even says it in the hospital. This is my third baby. Right. But they weren't sure who they were going to get. They were almost shot window shopping. And, and it's the father who creep by like. Okay. By accident, so, comes across Esther. Yes, but it's still a home full of ch- of girls that are older. They're, uh, and then the nun. Was it all girls? Yeah, they were all oh, okay. girls. And okay. Sister Abigail, because they go in and they go to this home for orphan girls. I don't know. Okay. But it's run by nuns. And Sister Abigail um, t- uh, praises them really for saying, oh, you know, not that many people would look for an older child and – and, you know, kind of giving them kudos for that, which yes. may have been, you know, if they're attention seeking, maybe they were like, oh, well, yes, we, we do want an old child. <laughs> so they're having a so the the, the sisters and the ch- and the little girls, they're all having a a party to kind of like a meet and greet kind of party. Sure. And um, Kate and John, her name's not Vera. In the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Kate and John are. um. Yes, they were kind of window shopping, yeah. but it's like John, this funny, creepy scene where he like goes off to the bathroom and then he decides to go walking around through this all girls school, to right? All girls schools up to yeah. the sleeping quarters. Yeah, I mean, I I guess like they're playing it off because he hears someone singing and it's interesting, so he kind of just wanders off innocently yeah, and whatever. But if you heard a little girl singing, even if you had all the best intentions, you'd have second thoughts about just going into her be bedroom. Walking <laughs> anywhere randomly in that kind of situation i'd be standing right there like okay you tell me which way we're going i'm not going nowhere <laughs> like that's a little strange that he gets like oh yeah okay and i came across this girl and she's asking him some questions and he decides to talk to her right so he finds esther in this classroom and she is painting and she's a great artist for a nine-year-old right. she's for- i mean she's a great artist And they kind of fall for each other. And then uh, Kate comes in with Sister Abigail and they're all kind of like, this could work. She's creative. She's artistic because Kate's character is a musician. Yeah. She's like some, uh, I don't know what kind of musician. She's a pianist. Yeah. She does maybe little jingles or something or whatever, but she plays very well. And apparently that was really her playing in the movie too. Yes, it was. Um, and then uh, John, he's an architect and he's mm-hmm. always drawing. So having found Esther, who can sing and draw, kind of fit both of their both of their needs, right, as parents. Yes. They would be able to relate to her. Mm-hmm. So they end up adopting her weeks later, the whole process. It doesn't take two days. Yeah, so they skip by later, that just like, oh, yeah. hey, we're, we're good to go. She's coming home now. Right. So weeks later, they bring her home. Mm-hmm. They introduce her to the kids. Daniel automatically doesn't like her. Max is excited she has a sister. Yeah, yeah. So now, just to recap again, real quick, there are two existing kids that are from uh, that are theirs, and there's a biologically a, theirs. biologically mm-hmm. theirs, and then there's a stillborn child which would have been their third sibling but never made it. Whatever. Right. She's planted yeah. in the garden. And then now they've adopted Esther. Esther to basically replace that void of not having a third child. I guess. Right. So the reasoning Kate had was I have all of this love that I could give to another child who needs it. Yeah. Which I get. <laughs> but okay. my own again, everybody grieves differently. So I can't say that I would do anything different and I can't say that I would do like, the exact same thing. Like, you know, you won't know until you're there. And everybody's different. Everybody thinks differently. Yeah. But I wouldn't do it. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> admirable thing to do. It's very, uh, it's tough. I first of all, I don't understand. It's very selfless, and that's great. You know, yeah, I don't understand it as much. I can't relate to it, I guess, as much. But um, I, I do see that there, it takes a lot of compassion and everything for somebody to, you know, want to take care of somebody else's child or just a so, child in general that's not even related to them. If I can share. Um, when I had my miscarriage, uh-huh. I had to tell the kids because they were all, my kids were already expecting, aware and expecting. Yeah. And since then, I have not tried to have another kid. Right. Um, a lot of it is also just, I realized that I was not ready to start all over all, again yeah. because my, my eldest was already 10 or so at the time. So, um, You're like I just got past all that stuff. I don't want to start <laughs> over again, <laughs> but also because I realized I wanted to focus on other things and I was focused on my career then. So right. I kind of just made a shift in 
in my in my priorities and what I found fulfilling and and realized my happiness was different. Sure. But um, so and that was their decision, and yeah, that's admirable. And there is so there are so many positive things about bringing in a child into your home, even if it's fostering, even if it's adopting for, um, I, I've seen people adopt children for various reasons, but as long as there's love in your heart, it's an admirable thing and yeah. more people should do it. I know my kids have already told me I'm only going to have canine grandchildren, <laughs> but my daughter has mentioned that if she does have kids, she's going to adopt. Uh, she said, she said she's the end of the, my bloodline. Okay. All, All right. right. <laughs> um, but right. Um, so as the movie progresses, you start to see that right away, there's definitely, um, the children, at least the brother, so, the brother really feels like he's being overshadowed. Like yeah. yeah. She Daniel doesn't like him. Does not like he doesn't it, like so. her. I mean, yeah. He doesn't like her. She's, uh, she dresses old fashioned. Mm -hmm. Um, she also wears a collar yeah. and wristlets. Right. Um, and that kind of makes her a little bit weird but even on the first day that they were that they were introducing them and they were giving her like welcome presents daniel was like vying for the family's attention and was yeah. getting very Wasn't upset he playing, he guitar was playing guitar hero <laughs> he's like look at me dad i'm being a it's kind yeah. of stupid but <laughs> yeah yeah but i i can i can understand his feelings also sure like, sure hey, yeah you already have children why are you getting a third right yeah it's it's a weird awkward situation why are you for a everybody third that is my age yeah because <laughs> he's also because he has a tree house and he and his friends go to the tree house and they have porn magazines there oh yeah he's also aware so maybe he's feeling some kind of way that this girl's moving in with them sure you know sure. I, there's lots of things to consider when you have children there's a lot of things to consider yeah, right. and i don't think they considered a lot of these things no i don't think they did yeah um okay so at that point um you know, they, the, the kids go to school. There's, there, of course, growing pains, um, things lost in translation, uh, people being rude to one another. But you, we find very, very quickly that Esther has a short temper. Right. She's, and we also find that she's very manipulative. Yeah. She doesn't like, uh, she already picks her enemies out easily. And she's got her own personal issues with everybody. And she already knows how she's going to handle it or something, mm -hmm. you know. Um, she's so got when a she, plan. You know? Well, yeah. When she goes yeah. to school, um, there's a girl that when she's introduced, to, when Esther is introduced to the classroom, there's this little girl. Uh, I don't yeah. remember her name. Makes fun of her. She makes fun of her. Yeah. And so automatically Esther yeah. stares her down like yeah. as she's walking by she, like, her. And she's like, on bitch, her ass. you done <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> Um, but the kids do make fun of her because she's different. She carries around a Bible and that's not something that, well, so I had some concerns because there's passing periods and the kids are like nine years old. Yeah. I mean, you know, these Hollywood versions of schools, like you're right. I don't, I think what you're saying is that in elementary school, you don't like leave one class and go to the other class. You're pretty much in the same classroom all day, uh, which I do think you are right, but Let's just say there must be some school somewhere where they're a little bit progressive and they do have like a switch from one class to the other. Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, <laughs> you know. That's fine. But I'm just saying I haven't seen that before. Um, I haven't either. I've and seen I, that starting in middle school. I think if you had a sit down conversation with the people who wrote it right now, they'd be like, holy shit, I didn't even think about that. You know, <laughs> like like what happened in. Uh... Uh, nope, let's not talk about that. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, you know, they're, they're still trying to get. So, how do I say this? You find that Esther is fucking weird as shit. Yeah. You find that she's painting some things um, in her room because they gave her this room and they gave her art supplies. But she is painting some kind of scary things in that um, black light paint. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, you're like, right. Like, black like, light paint. Like, yeah. she, like, let's she, say she has a painting of a house. But when you have the black light on it, yeah, it's like engulfed other, in yeah, flames, sure, right, right. as an example. Yeah. So she's doing those things. And she had previously said she wanted to learn the piano, but she plays better than Kate. Right. Right. And so, yeah, there's all these little signs already that are showing that there's something up with her. She's not your average nine-year-old girl. Um, and she's definitely got a short fuse. And you got to watch and her. And she's driving a wedge in between Kate and John. Yep. And she does that by whispering kind of little things into each person's ears. For example, one time they went to the park. Um, it was John with the kids went to the park. Um, and there was the neighbor lady was flirting with him. 
Of course, oh, right, at, yeah. later on, Esther tells Kate, and then they have kind of an argument yeah, about it. She uses that all they're every, flirting. Yeah, she's um, yeah. She uses all these little things for her to her advantage and everything. Like right, that. and then she, at one point she walks in on Kate and John having sex in the kitchen. Oh yeah, and then but, she's like, "I know they fuck when, yeah. when she's talking to Kate about it." Um, so you realize, oh, she's a little ahead of herself right. for a nine-year-old. My yeah. nine-year-old's don't say fuck. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or they she, don't know what fucking is, it, even if they know the word fuck. It was something like you knew that was going to happen. They were like being very, you know, nonchalant about like yeah. we're in the kitchen. So if you have kids in your house, you know, like <laughs> I, I haven't yet to find somebody who has sex in the kitchen with their kids hardly asleep. Like she's still doing the dinner dishes, so yeah, that's a little bit again over the top. But all right, let's just say it happened, and again, we knew it was going to happen, and right. boom, Esther sees, and now, they're all traumatized in a way. And we we do see that Esther kind of creeps around the house. Um, she has her own issues, like she needs to lock the door when she takes a shower. She doesn't want to come anybody coming in there, so yeah. she sings while she showers so that people know she's okay. Yeah, um, which is you know. Well, that was already the CSI another sign mind right happens. there. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this: um, If you were to have adopted somebody that age, in in this, I don't know, in our society now with all the technology we have, would you like have cameras or something set up in a way just so you could keep an eye out on this person, just to see if they were playing, or would you I just give biological total children and trust? I have cameras? No, I know, but not like, on them, but like in the common areas, like in the living room. Yeah, sure. And the entrances. But you, you know? see what I'm saying? It's like they give total trust to this girl where I feel like they should have been a little weary, like, oh, Especially well, since they live in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And they have this architecturally beautiful house, but it's definitely not kid friendly. Sure. They live in the fucking woods. Woods, right. Yeah. Let, but forget about watching the kids. What about intruder alerts? <laughs> like, do you have an alarm? Why do you have a gun in your cell for that kids can access, you know? Right, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it definitely, like I said, their house is huge. It's in, in the middle of nowhere. And you're right, absolutely. It's uh, it's just something that I'm just saying, like, I, I don't know if I would trust somebody right away enough to be like, well, I'm not going to even just keep tabs on you, you know, in a nice way. You know, I just feel like they're completely, like, trusting right off the bat. And they're like, well, well we're going to, you know, put this person to sleep and not yeah. imagine that they're mm-hmm. going to get up and wander around the house. You know, right. But especially because, okay, so here's the thing. This is how Sister Abigail came to have um, Esther available for adoption. Is that the what you use? But she was adopted by this family from Russia. Like she was adopted from Russia by this family. Right. Previously. Yeah. Previously. This family's house burned down and nobody survived except for Esther. Except for Esther. And so now Esther is with Sister Abigail. Yeah. Okay, so one, there might be some psychological trauma just from the fire alone sure. and having been, you know, an orphan from that. Yeah, that alone is going to give you some kind of trauma. Yeah, um, Let alone having come from a different country, you speak differently, you're going into this random person's house. Mm-hmm. Um, there are psychological and mental health issues that you have to consider before you even let this child into your home. Yeah. Yes, it's wonderful. Bring in... Kids, I, I have a child with special needs. I would want somebody to care for my child if something were to happen to me and I'll welcome them into a loving home. But also do your due diligence. Figure out what support do I need to offer? What accommodations do I need to make at home? Okay, so she can't be, she doesn't, she wants her privacy in the bathroom, which she should. Nobody should be going into this stranger, essentially, I've known you for a month kid and be allowed to walk in there. Yeah. Right. But yeah, also, you that. also need to have a physician give a physical and say, hey, are you healthy? Not even about whether or not I'll adopt you if you're healthy or not. It's sure. It's well, let's make sure you're good. Well, that's the first that, thing I would do is take the child to the doctor and be like, does she have any needs? Do I have to get her on? Is she anemic? Do I have to get her on iron? You think that. You're right. They, she would have had to have some sort of a checkup with a doctor or something at some point to where maybe they would discover the marks that we find out she has later on and, and just we, something about her. There is one point where we do understand that she won't go to the dentist. Yeah, right. She won't go to, because they'll – dental records and they'll be able to tell well, how Well, I'll tell you when we get there why. Right. But um, that's fine. But you take a child to the doctor. Right, Yeah. 
I mean, that's where they when I was watching even... it, I was really trying to be like, look, don't take it critically. Like, literally, I mean, like, that's it's what I do. <laughs> it's uh, well, I always try to be like, well, that wouldn't really happen. And then, like, you know, it does sort of like spoil some of the fantasy of right, it for me. I guess so, so, so this time I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Fuck they it. didn't take it, it to the doctor. <laughs> but kids require an annual physical. Yeah, sure. And even to go in school, you need to have your vaccinations up to date. You need to make sure. I know. They take you to inside this yeah. room and they tell you to pull your pants down. They grab your nuts and they tell you to turn to the right and cough. Oh, man. <laughs> That's what they did all the time. That's their physical. <laughs> Do you want to talk about this off air? I'm I'm sure it happens at all the elementary schools. At school? Yeah, this happened at school. This was the school physical. They like what? <laughs> yes, I'm pretty sure this was like a standard. Oh, procedure. honey, I don't think so. <laughs> at school, this is a standard procedure. I don't think that's right. I yeah, don't think yeah, that's yeah, correct. Yeah. I know. Well, at least we in Massachusetts, a, we had a scoliosis we exam. Like we had the. Our PE teacher, I think it was in seventh grade, oh, sorry. had us bend over and <laughs> check our spine, but not our nuts. Not that I have nuts, but I don't know. I've never been the dude, so I don't know. But I don't think they're authorized to touch your. <laughs> this is how they did testicles. the uh, physical, and like this is Massachusetts. I was talking about a physical, <laughs> like that your doctor signs off on the form. Yeah, the kid's fine. Sure, right. So this was but like a like physical you had to take. private physician, not the school nurse. <laughs> they did it at school. They like would test for lice and stuff like that. Yes, they check for lice <laughs> on your head. <laughs> Just, not pubic lice. Well, from my memory, if I recall, there was at least. Are you crying? No, I'm not crying. I don't know. What, I'm not crying. I'm just saying like it sounds very strange now and you're making me think like, whoa, did this only happen in my school? Is this some weird ass But it wasn't thing? just you? It was like a yeah, room full of did. boys and all of well, you had your no, pants down? They took everybody one by one. It was like, <laughs> it was a thing where they would take one by one. If you guys had <laughs> similar experience, please let me know because I think I might want to get <laughs> Stefan a therapist if that's the case. I don't know. If that's not the case, I don't know. I but thought if that anybody this was can a shed thing. some light on this from other than our yeah, they grab your nuts and they tell you to turn to the right and cough. <laughs> Shit. I thought that was as like, like let's see. Do let me look it up. I'm pretty Do sure that this is a thing. At least in Massachusetts check. back in the eighties. <laughs> Testicles. Te- testicles. I, rem- I I remember it happening. It was weird, but it was short and quick, and that was that was it. I think. How I'm, old were you? I, I was in elementary school. I had to be um, first, second, third, fourth, or fifth grade. It <laughs> says here that it's an exam that starts in your teens. No, this was in. Massachusetts, and I was in this this particular time was when I was between first to fifth grade. So I want to say probably it was somewhere around first or second or third grade, maybe. Um, it could have mm. been as late as fourth or fifth, but I, I do remember it happening once. I thought it was strange because I never remember having to take my <laughs> clothes off in front of somebody who, like... <laughs> So I can't, I'm, I'm laughing, but I'm, it's okay. Take the time you need. <laughs> Don't look at me that way. It's only How am I looking at you? <laughs> oh, shit. That's <laughs> funny. Nothing happened. I'm telling you, nothing happened. You're crying. <laughs> I'm crying in laughter because of the fact that it looks like that, and I can see why. <laughs> Did you tell your parents about this? Uh, Did you tell a grown up? I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure they I'm knew. I'm going to call your mom. <laughs> All right. Anyways, let's take it back. Who is this teacher? 
This was like a thing. The whole every kid in the school had to go through. Did you ask your friends if they had their testicles fondled? <laughs> it's not like look, they do Did the same. Did you ask your friends if they Wait. checked their nuts? Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> All right. Stefan, were you sexually assaulted in elementary school? <laughs> No, no, never. I'm telling you, no. I <laughs> there's no reason to hide it. I just can't stop laughing. I'm gonna because ask my brother from... if he had his nuts checked <clears throat> at school. Listen, it obviously happens when you go to your regular physical, right? For but the, the school doctor it doesn't have a doctor. The school no, has a nurse. They brought in a doctor. They did it at the school. <laughs> a certain day, they like brought yeah, in a guy. That seems more legit. <laughs> Who do I know that's a dude that's awake at this time? Look. That I can say, hey, excuse me, by the way, speaking of nuts. It happened, I think, once or twice that I can remember. I know that they did the lice thing and they did something else, I think, whatever. Um, But it was one time and it was like a quick thing where they took one by one and it wasn't like just the doctor. There was a doctor and the nurse in the room because if it was a girl – they had the lady nurse, I guess, whatever, because I don't know what they did with the girls. But I'm saying every we all lined up as a single file by class by class. And throughout the day, you'd had to go and wait in line and they'd take you in the room and they'd do this quick little physical on you. And again, it was the same type of physical that I feel like the regular pediatricians do. So it wasn't anything weird. I know I'm laughing like it's crazy, which is funny because, again, it sounds like – and you're looking over at me over here like there was something, you know – I'm Some deep concerned. trauma that I've been oppressing this whole time. No, it it happened, and it was Is that like why a you quick... don't like it when I punch you in the nuts. No, I, nobody likes it when I get punched <laughs> in the nuts. But um, I remember this happening, and it was like weird because I didn't know what. what oh, really? And I just remember dropping my pants all the way to the floor <laughs> because I was like, "Okay, I guess we're doing this." And they were like. They kind of were like had a reaction like, well, you don't got to pull them down that far. You know what I mean? It was like one of those things. And then they just did the little thing like, okay, open your mouth, whatever. And they grab you by the nuts. Open your mouth? Well, I think they did the ears and the eyes, you know, the stethoscope and the check your throat first. And then they like, you know, grab your nuts, like turn to the right and cough. And you go, and then they like maybe make you cough one more time. Mm -hmm. And then that's it. And then you're like, all right, good. And see you later. I wonder if that was a thing because before not everybody had health coverage or could afford going to the doctor. <laughs> right. Well, again, I, it wasn't like a routine thing. I've never it did had happen. A, a doctor or a, anybody at school like grab my tits <laughs> or anything. <laughs> I, now, looking back at it, it does seem pretty strange. And I don't know any school that would do this, but I'm telling you, I think this I happened at my school checks. one time. Yeah. Um. But I don't, and I remember scoliosis checks, but I don't remember. Yes. I mean, but I, again, I'm not the dude, so I, I never had testicles for them to check. I just remember it because, again, that was the first time I was like, whoa, I'm supposed to take my pants off in front of these people. I don't know who they are. And right. it was like strange for me because I was like probably nine or so. I was about that age or whatever, maybe. And I was like, I also did it without thinking, like I said, because they were like, whoa, you don't got to take them down. I did one of those things where I was like, drop them all the way, <laughs> just let it hang. Um, but then, uh, yeah, then I was out and on my way and that was it. Okay. <clears throat> well, as long as you don't have trauma. I don't. I did have a karate teacher who got um, put in jail for sexual assault, but it never did anything with uh, me or any of the people that I was friends with. He was into um, girl, like, well, he was into the moms of some of the people, but then he was also, I guess, having relationships with one of the uh, underage Mm -hmm. girls. That was for your Shaka Khan karate? Yeah, Shotokan karate, yeah. It was strange because I felt like I got so much out of that. And then years later, I'm but like... so many people were destroyed because of it. Right, yeah. yeah. And I just was like blown away. I was like, whoa, that guy... But I, you know what? It's not like I didn't believe it. I saw... I kind of saw it happening, you know, like because he, he was a super flirt. Well, first of all, when I was in the thing, his wife and his son were also in the class. Mm. And he took... 
like this was a very very intense karate for at the time like we got hit and we hit other people and it was like hardcore karate it wasn't like this like tap you know like sport like karate and we were always like man he beats the shit out of his wife and his kid in class like imagine what they have to go home to after this i mean if you're, no, I'm not gonna make that joke. <laughs> but but while he was there, he w- we would always notice that he was like very flirty with a lot of the moms and stuff like that. Mm. Even though the the his mother, I mean his kid and the her his wife were in the class with us. Yeah. Whatever. That's very strange. Very strange. Yeah. Um, but no, I've never been a victim of sexual trauma of any sorts. Um, I laughed my ass off because I understand it seemed very strange, but, and, and if that really isn't a thing and they just did this at my high school, my uh, elementary school and it was called case case. No, no Logan elementary school or something like that. It was in Massachusetts, Swansea, Massachusetts. I don't know. I'm pretty sure you guys, can y'all do me a solid and let us know if, this is a thing? No, not Logan. Luther. I remember now. Luther Elementary School. Um, that was that was it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Again, I, I I had a few friends there. I don't remember now vividly being like, hey, did they grab your nuts too? But I'm pretty sure they did it to all the I mean, kids. I know it's school. an exam that happens in men or boys. Yeah. Or it's, teenagers. It, it's physical. But, yeah, standard um, physical. And I get that. But no, I still don't know I why they do think it. They though. would do it at school. Right. I think it's to check for any nodules or any testicular cancer sure. or hardness or something <laughs> like they do for, for women. You have to do a self check to make sure there sure. aren't any masses. Okay. Yeah. But wow. Okay. So anyway, they should have given a physical to this kid. <laughs> right. Esther. That was a funny tangent. We just went <laughs> on right there. But, um, but really that's like your basics. You get a new car, you get a, you, you get a used car. And I'm not saying that children that are orphans are used kids, even though I jokingly do call them used from time to time during this movie. But when you get a used car, you get a mechanic to check that shit out. Sure. Of Why course. wouldn't you do that to a child? Not to check out whether or not you're going to buy it, but check to make sure that you have all the accommodations in place. Yeah. You know, if somebody was going to adopt me when I was a child, they were going to need to. Hmm. What was my weirdness as a kid? Well, what I can add to that. They rule... would have needed to make sure that I wasn't going to set shit on fire because I used to set shit on fire. You're a pyro. Yeah. Well, what I was going to add to that too is that because a lot of people who are in or- orphanage or whatever in these situations, foster kids, a lot of them do come from abuse abusive households and have past history that mm-hmm. maybe you'd want to even just see, mm-hmm. hey, do they, do they have previous scars or injuries from some traumatic experience in the past that, or whatever? I can imagine that a lot of them, not a lot of them, but I don't, I don't know the, 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 the statistics or anything, but I can imagine there are many who run away. Sure. So, and because they run away and they can maybe go off and have these seedy lives, why wouldn't you at the very least document scars or birthmarks sure. in the event of something bad. Yeah. So the that's um, obviously something I think, yeah, they should have done. But if they did, we wouldn't have had this movie. So in the, yeah. uh, in the uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, just for sake of having a good time and enjoying a movie that is just supposed to entertain you, uh, obviously they got around that loophole pretty easily. Right. Okay, so at the park, um, at a park outing, Esther, that little bully, she throws her off of the top of a slide. Yeah, she's, and the little girl breaks her leg. She starts her like her rampage. rampage quickly. Max, the the little sister, sees it, but can does not tell on her because she's scared of her. Yeah, I had issues with the her holding back so much. I feel like she should have trusted in her parents and everything a little bit more and just known that they would have protected her we know that max at one point because her mom was so drunk she allowed for her to go play at the like this frozen pond that's in their yard right and she fell in and almost died right because her mom was drunk so i can understand not having the full trust or feeling like um that she's supported sure additionally when you have um, 
and and I'm speaking of this solely as um, someone who has been in abusive relationships before. Uh-huh. Uh, this relationship with Max and Esther, it's it's an abusive relationship. So being that I've had that experience, they have the abusers have a tendency to make you feel isolated from everybody else, make you feel dependent on them. Sure. And in the case of Esther, but also in my case, there was also the threat um, to harm somebody you care about. Sure. I think that's the big one. I think those things factor into why Max didn't want to tell what was happening. Right. Their fear of losing or harming someone that's close to them is, you know, so much that they don't want to make any right. wrong mistakes and or anything. It, it becomes a big deal because at, at the same time, um, so these are all the people that start dying around them. Right. Uh, Sister Abigail goes and does a wellness check, but also starts speaking with Kate about, hey, we don't know where this girl came from because actually we don't have any of her records. Right. And, um, and she gets killed on the way out of from visiting them. Shall we say she gets killed the fuck up? No, because somebody else gets killed the fuck oh, up. Oh, okay. I don't want to save it. All right, all right. We'll but save it. We'll save it. She gets Sorry. hammer time. She does get some hammer time. Because, so what Esther, so what is Esther pretty ballsy. does, she's super manipulative. Yeah. She tells Max, the bad lady is here and she's going to take me away unless you help me. Yeah. And they super go. Super manipulative. Super, yeah. They go and they run her off the road and then drag her out of the car and hit beat her, her with a hammer hit her, beat yeah. her with a hammer and then hide her body you know and then max you know um esther, esther tells max that she's part of it she'll get in trouble too yeah. and they hide the evidence in right. the treehouse like esther doesn't give a fuck she's super she's like i don't even care if i have to kill this person and drag their body like i'll do it like yeah. she's already like in there's not even a second yeah. thought about it she's crazy yeah uh, at one point Kate is dropping the kids off at school. It's dropping off Daniel and Esther and then dropping oh, off right. Max. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what Esther does is she slices open Daniel's backpack so that when he gets out of the car and go, starts going up the steps towards class, his stuff his falls out. Stuff falls yeah. out. Now, did I didn't I missed the whole slicing of the backpack. Yeah, well, I saw that she reached down. Okay. There was a sound okay. gotcha. and then, you know, that happened because Kate puts the car in park, yeah. actively does that. And goes up and says, this is a new backpack. What happened? Right. In the meantime, Esther comes out the car, comes around it, takes off the parking brake, puts right. the car in neutral. And Max it's is still in inside. there. And the car starts rolling right. down the hill and nearly avoids getting hit. Kate is running after the car. Some other random guy is trying to help. Yeah, and he gets fucked up too. He gets fucked up. He gets dragged. He almost gets it and he's like opening the door and yeah, fa-boom. Yeah, he gets it's- <laughs> That's inertia man <laughs> uh, but then uh you know max almost dies yeah and she is terrified she still right. can't tell um she still can't tell um the, her parents anything yeah in another instance um oh and after that daniel goes to check on max secretly because previously esther had gone to max and threatened to cut his nuts off oh right <laughs> You know, he didn't stop fucking with wait, her. Wait, wait. She, Esther went to Daniel. Daniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think oh, you I'm said sorry. Max. Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, and so, and so um, Daniel is scared of her. Yeah, right. Of course. Max is scared of her. And then Daniel has to sneak into Max's room to ask if she's okay after the accident. Yeah. But then That's Max, why I'm scared of you, by the way. <laughs> why? I'm just kidding. You're scared of me. Why? Because <laughs> he might. What? <laughs> No, I was making a you threatened to cut my nuts off kind of joke. I would never threaten you. <laughs> no, I know. I wouldn't threaten you. I know at you all. wouldn't. I know you wouldn't threaten. Look, you see the evil coming over. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't threaten you, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Get a good look at that face. So, um, Max starts like she pulls out these these. Drawings, drawings that she did yeah. of all the crimes that Esther has done. Throwing the girl away, throwing the girl away, throwing the girl down the thing. Um, you know, the the, the car, the, the killing of Sister Abigail. Oh, right. You know, all of those things. So um, he's like, okay, well, where is the evidence? If it's still in the treehouse, I'll go get it. But Esther is listening in. Right? She knows what she's doing. Now, at the same time, 
Kate and John are downstairs speaking with Kate's therapist. Yeah. Because before all of this, there has there has been some turmoil between Esther and and um Oh, we, we grazed over well, I don't know if you want to go back to it or not. Well, so you can do, totally do everything yeah, you want. But the breaking of the arm, that's some psychopathic well, shit. Well, so right there. here's what happens. John is spending time with Esther because uh Kate says she needs some help. Um and she's t- getting tired of Esther like doing shit. Like she's doing shit. And she can't quite pinpoint what the issue is, but something's fucking up. And sure. John won't listen to her. Right. And it drives Kate to just seem like she's going insane. Right. And at one point, John tells Esther, you should do something nice for her. So what does Esther do? She, yeah. She, she decides gives her to give this her bouquet of a, roses uh-huh. that she picked from their greenhouse, which is... Where the, the shrine was. Is, that is, yeah... That is baby Jessica. Baby Jessica's so shrine. Vera sees it and is hysterical and she grabs her by the arm right. and starts telling her, why did you do this? Why did you? Well, understandably, super emotional. Yeah. Um, and so at this point, John is upset with her. Um, Kate goes and get, goes to a liquor store and gets some alcohol. She's an alcoholic, but she hasn't been drinking. She's been sober since the accident with Max. Right. She did a little like, I don't know, I'm going to go grab a bottle and I'm just going to, I don't know, I'm like, going to do it. Shit. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But then she's <laughs> but not she, going to do she it. she decides not to do it. <clears throat> now, now the therapy, uh, no, okay. so then on top of that, Esther goes down into the workshop and breaks her own arm in a yeah, vice. In a vice. It's some crazy shit. And then she blames, and then so she makes she it seem it like up, Vera right. had broken her arm. Yeah, she sets it up. Uh, so basically she goes, crawls into bed and calls, Daddy, come check. Uh, my arm still hurts, Daddy. And then he's like, no, it's all right. And let me check it out. And then it's all of a sudden broken. he realizes it's broken. And then so... He turns around. He's like, I saw you like grab her by the Mm -hmm. arm. You grabbed her so hard you broke her arm. And then Kate's over there like, there's no way I could have broke her arm. And she's she's got to be – I feel like, you know, I kind of understand her position. Like she's in a place where she's telling the truth and nobody believes her. But it's so fantastic that it – Right. And nobody believes her. And she's like, how the fuck could I have broken that bitch's arm? (laughs) I didn't barely fucking touch That's a nine-year-old bitch. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But he's over there like, but it's fucking broken. What are you going to say? You know? Right. Right. So at this point, Esther decides she wants to sleep with daddy and they make uh, Kate sleep somewhere else. Yeah, he goes, which is when, on the couch. Yeah. So which is when Kate goes and gets um, wine or whatever. She decides not to drink it. But then that accident happens with Max the next day in the oh, car the, rolling down the hill. Right. So then when they're talking with the therapist, the therapist yes. uh, they bring up the bottle of wine. Right. And he said, the girls found this. The girls are Esther. Yeah. You know what it is. Yeah. And so it's, it's driving, like it's, it's ruining their marriage. Yeah. Right. And, and there's another part where she's like, well, that was not what you think it is. And she's telling the damn truth, but yeah. they're like, it's a bottle of wine. She's it's like, I actually the, yeah. bought two bottles of wine. Yep. One, I threw it down the drain yeah. and I didn't drink the other right. one. And you guys, you have to believe me. And he's like, like, I don't. That doesn't really help your you? case at yeah. all. <laughs> it just means you drank a whole other one. Right, yeah. Um, but it just happens to be, you know, the reason why Max had rolled down the hill. Like, sure. it, it makes sense. And I understand how, why Esther did that to right. dr- further drive a wedge because she's them. smart she's yeah, like she's super manipulative super smart. yeah um during this time kate is trying to figure out where did esther actually come from and we're finding out more and more information um oh right the yeah, house burned yeah. down yes but also the documentation was fraudulent yeah find she- i find out later that she's actually from the Scarn Institute. Yeah, so Sarn, Scarn, Scarn. Oh, Scarn is Michael Scott's. Uh... Yeah, I think it's the Sarn Institute. <laughs> the Sarn Institute. Yeah, um, which is some place in like Estonia. Estonia. Or some yeah, shit. we find out that she's actually yeah. from East, in Estonia, um, and they have no records of right. her as a child there. So they're doing a little bit more research. To do some research. Yeah. So yeah. it's sister Abigail is dead. So then her the next person is also helping her. So Daniel now knows that sister Abigail is dead. 
So he's going up into the treehouse yeah, to, to get that evidence. that evidence. Right. But you know who else is going up to the treehouse? Fucking Esther. And in the most insane thing ever, she sets the treehouse on fire while yeah. burning the quote evidence so that right. to protect Max and locks him in the treehouse. Yeah. Well, she locks him in there. She's also very like <laughs> she's using a lighter fluid and she's making like a little bonfire with all the the papers and stuff and the evidence but she also clearly shoots that lighter um, fluid, lighter at, fluid him. at him and gets him sort of on his leg or whatever right and and locks him in there. locks him in there and again doesn't give a fuck like she knows like the mom is literally inside the mom and the grandma right and Maybe they're even watching, but she doesn't give a shit. She's she knows that she's gonna turn around and play her manipulative game mm-hmm. and go with this story that she's already f- whatever you know. Mm-hmm. But anyways, like she's watching this whole thing burn down into flames. The kid is kind of stupid because he, he tries his best to get out and he does, but he goes on the roof of the thing, which is the worst place to go because now it's burning from the bottom mm-hmm. and it's hot. But and I said he should have just jumped off, but he ends, he up, ends up falling off. Falling off. off. And, and technically it was a pretty long fall. It was a big fall. He <laughs> falls and is unconscious when he falls. Yeah. And then Esther picks up a heavy rock oh, yeah. and She's is going ready to, to kill him, to do him but in. Max pushes her away. Yep. Comes to save the day. Fucking Max comes flying through. Bam. Knocks her over. And then Vera comes running up about a minute, no, 30 seconds later or whatever. Right. Um, right. And, and, and so Daniel is in the hospital. Yeah. Daniel's in the hospital. The mom knows Esther did something. Yeah. You know, the mom knows it's, it's Esther. Um, the, the dad is like, well, you know, you don't know it's Esther. And then, uh, and Kate is like, your mom was even there. Like it was Esther. Right. And he will not believe her because who, like, really, are you going to believe a nine-year-old tried to kill this uh, other Yeah, kid? of course. You don't want to believe that because it's not yeah. typical behavior. It seems outlandish and it's just yeah. definitely not something you want to even buy into. It's like, what? This little nine-year-old's yeah. capable but of that? The crazy shit is Max is now terrified of her. Sure. Um, Kate told the grandmother, you make sure she sits there. Yeah. But Esther's manipulative. Oh, right. When she they're in the waiting room or whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And she goes and she sneaks away and suffocates Daniel. I know. She's like, I'm not even done with him. I and almost, she's I was- like super smart about it because she takes his, um, his, uh, the little meter finger pulse yeah, thing. Yeah. Right. And she puts it on her own finger. Sure. However, and then kills him. If you want to be really technical, her struggling would have probably it made did. the meter jump. You saw her. You saw her heart rate elevating. Oh, okay. All right. Um, and then it went beep. Yeah. When she took it off, um, and then every there's like code blue, code blue. Everybody's running. Kate goes, "Where the fuck is Esther?" Right. And she goes and she looks for her. Here comes Esther walking around the corner drinking a fucking soda. Right. But Max had gone to try to look for her and saw that she wasn't getting a soda. Right. Yeah. So. We know what happened, of course. Kate, uh, Max knows what happens. Kate knows what happens because in front of the whole hospital staff, she slaps the fuck out of him. Fuck, yeah. And says, what did you do to yep. Daniel? Gives him, she gives her a good slap. Yeah. But that doesn't help her case at all because now basically they think that she's loony and they're going to make – they have yeah, to they put her – Yeah, they sedate her. Yeah, they have to sedate her and they're going to make her stay overnight mm-hmm. for observation or whatever. Yep, which means that, that – which means that John, Max – and Esther are, are home, home by alone. themselves. Yep. Esther is like, cha-ching, this is what I've been waiting for. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the psychiatrists uh-huh. from the Sarn Institute are trying to call Kate. Get a hold of Kate. Yep. And tells them, this is not an orphanage, but We're a the picture hospital. that you sent yeah. is of a mental uh, patient of ours. Right. Named, what was her name? Uh, I don't remember the name. But they basically- Lena. T- oh, right, Lena. Her name was yeah. Lena. And she was a 33-year-old woman. Right, with but, some sort of uh, abnormal Yeah, so her issue was she had hypopituitarism. Pituitarism, which is a form of dwarfism of some it, sort. It keeps her from being able to produce enough hormones to be able to- It's when your pituitary gland fails to produce one or more hormones or it doesn't produce enough hormones. The pituitary okay. gland is a kidney bean sized gland situated basically. the base. Okay, that's all I got. As far as I got, and then I got distracted. Um, and so um, she masquerades as a child. Sure. 
tries to seduce the husband. Yeah, this is her game. She's yeah. done this before. Tries to seduce she obviously, the husband. Yeah. And when she can't, she just she kills slaughters the, whole family. the family. Right. So you're like, oh fuck. And I at think, least she hasn't run into a pedophile. Yeah. Well, right. That, that that would be a whole other story. But that's probably what she would want, really. You know, because then she'd find someone to give her the love that she needs. I guess. Right. And I'll get to that. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, so what I was going to say that she does have like a book with like pictures in it, and I think she mm-hmm. definitely has done this at least four or five times. Right. So Kate knows that she's from the Sarn Institute uh-huh. because. The one book that she does carry with her, it's not a Bible. It's this book, and um, and this book has all of these pictures of all the men that she's probably sure. done this to already. Right. Including John. Right. His picture's in there, too. Yeah. 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 So they get home, and he gets drunk. Yeah, he's like, he's he pretty, loses he, it He now. puts, yeah. He, he, I mean, can you imagine? Well, Your you son's know. dying in the hospital. Right. Your wife is sedated because she attacked your adopted daughter. Yeah. It's a fucking And then you have another child who situation. is traumatized throughout this whole right. thing. Right. And, and one of them is deaf on top of that, which is already a, something to deal with, like the, right. hard to deal with, I mean. Right. It's just like an, a, a pile of things all together. And it just like breaks him down. And he's like, you know what? I'm getting drunk. So first he puts Max to bed. Yeah. And – um. During this time, because uh, Max does have these hearing, hearing aids, aids right. um, Esther steals them in front of in him. In front of him, yep. Like, she's just so slick with it. Yep. Um, but Max has a chance to say something, and she doesn't. She doesn't, She right. just can't do it. Um, because at one point, uh, Esther said, if you tell, I'm going to shoot mommy. Right, right, yeah. And again, that's, again, the abusive behavior, the mm. abusive, yeah. So... Anyway, Max is going to bed. Right. Uh, John goes downstairs, starts getting fucking drunk. Yeah. He gets so low. So I watched. He basically drank a whole bottle of wine in two two cups. But he also gulped them. Like So essentially it was like pound in one, pour it, pound in the other, and that was the whole bottle of wine. I was like yeah. – I was pretty impressed is what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and, that, and who knows if they – you know. He had some something else too, but right. he, that that shit fucked him up, uh, pretty good, pretty fast. And Esther decides she's gonna make her move, and uh, and she gets stalled up. <laughs> yeah, this is where the movie she takes puts a little on these weird baby turn, heels, like this her size heels. Yeah. Like, where did you get that? I get that she took one of Kate's negligees and customized it. Sure. But um, right. John is like, what did you put on your face? Don't do this. Go to bed. Go to bed. And she keeps – she starts calling him John instead of daddy. Right, yeah. And she's like trying to seduce him. He was like – he's like, what the fuck are you doing? No. Right. He no. finally kind of snaps out of it. He's like, no, go to bed. Yeah. This is – no, this is wrong. And again, like you mentioned, it's a good thing he wasn't a pedophile because – well, uh, yes, it's a good thing he wasn't a pedophile because that's fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so speak. So I guess the original story, um, her dad was a pedophile. And that's why she. Oh, really? Yeah. Esther? Uh, es- uh, yeah, es- yeah. Lena. Lena. Lena's original dad was a pedophile. Ah, okay. And um, that's why she has, she equates love with, with sex. All right. Which well, that does makes happen sense. a lot with people who have been sure. sexually abused as children. Right. Um, so we do find out also when the doc, when that psychiatrist calls Kate that the the, the collar, the collar uh, and the wristlets she wears them to, to cover, cover the, the scars, scars yeah. from the straight jackets. Yeah, because that was where they were like, you would have known because she's got these scars. Mm-hmm. You would have had to have seen them, and then boom, that makes sense. She covered them. That's why she never wanted to show anybody, you know. Her, her, you know, she dressed the way she dressed. Yeah. She did the shower thing, you know, mm-hmm. avoided having to be going to places right. where that would but, have been. So when uh, when exposed. John, yeah, sorry. totally, sorry. So when John tells her no, she goes upstairs. She throws a fucking fit, and then she starts removing all her makeup that makes her look young. Yeah, and then she removes the collar and the wristlets, and she removes the binding on her chest. 
Oh, is that what that was? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. You know so how it that looked means, like bandage? Yeah. So, yeah, it's the binding. So that kept her boobs from like... From showing. Yeah, not that she had like big tits anyways, but it was... yeah More than a nine-year-old. More than a nine-year-old, yeah. So, she takes her little like uh And then that's the dentist out. part. She had child-looking teeth. Yeah. Um, they were like moldings. Like over yeah. her normal gnarly mouth. Right, yeah. So yeah, she she basically takes her fucking facade off and says, "I'm gonna Fuck fucking this shit. It yeah, is on, on yeah. motherfucker." And um, and we see that she's like kind of doing this cat and mouse game with Max, who at this point has also woken up, right, and can't find her hearing aid. So she's like kind of sneaking around the house. Sure. John is like, "What is all that sound?" Right. Goes up to Esther's room and doesn't find her there, but sees that there's an interesting thing with the black light. Yep. Turns the black light on to the wall and sees that there's all He's, this shit yeah, yeah. It painted in the black light paint. Yes. And it's um, homicidal mm-hmm. and uh, pornographic. Pornographic and homicidal. Yeah, there's huge murals of like people fucking and well, of, people I, I dying. thought it was her and John. It's probably her and yeah. John, yeah. Now, when I was in college, I did my dorm room like that. Full of violence and pornography? Tell me more. I painted my room with black light paint, or technically, what I just used was detergent. Um, really? Yeah. yeah, I just used. I think it might have been all you know, one of those the laundry detergents, mm-hmm. Tide, one of those you know name brand ones, whatever. And I would just you know pour a little bit in a cup, take a paintbrush, and I'd paint. And if you turn the lights off and painted, you can see what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And so I painted all this shit. My dorm room was crazy. It was like already crazy as it was. I had um, – because I got lucky when I went to college. I was supposed to have a, a roommate in my dorm room. Um, and for some reason, he didn't – he got – I don't know. He, he got an apartment or something else or he didn't come – whatever. I got lucky because he never showed up. So I got a double room to myself. And so I did my room tight. Um and I had posters. Hi. Yeah, it was cool. I had posters everywhere, <laughs> all this whatever. Um, you know, it was like typical like college dorm room shit. I had some you know, high times pull out, some center folds and things like that, you know, some um whatever. dorm room of the nineties. Yeah. And so I did the whole room with this black light shit and a lot of it was pretty crazy. And so the the, the icing on the cake of what I did was I actually took a little like tray, pour some of the stuff in the tray, dip my feet in it. And I walked over, like I used furniture and shit so I could like put footprints on the ceiling and on the wall. And I walked around the whole room and in the middle of the room, I did a dead body outline, like a crime scene outline. And, uh, so I would bring people in the room and then all of a sudden I'd flip the light on and this whole scene. <laughs> when did you study? <laughs> oh, I, I didn't study in college. I was just there to have a good time. And trust me, that was some pretty fun times. I mean, I put a lot into that shit. Yeah, I was... it sounds like you did. <laughs> the payoff was nice, though. You know, people would, like, freak out and get somebody over your dorm and then you turn the lights <laughs> off. And she's like, what the fuck is this? Oh, well, I'm sure you got laid a lot. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, going back to the movie, John sees Esther's uh, extravagant mural creations. Yeah. And And then, but then he he finally does run into her. She, like, she stabs him, kills him him multiple times, kills him at the base of the stairs. Yeah. I feel bad for John because he couldn't, you know, he just died. Yeah. Like, he just got, you kind of want him to live because he really wasn't a bad guy. He was just right, you not know, very he, attentive. He wasn't really attentive he, he to his children. He didn't believe his wife because he had reason to doubt her, although he was a fucking uh, cheater and gave reason that he should have been. I think he felt like he had the upper hand now because he's like, well, yeah, I cheated on you, but you're fucking up more. You're a drunk and you almost you killed her, you know, almost killed one kid and had fucking, you know, I don't know, the stillborn thing. I don't know if he blamed her for it, but. You, know, you can't blame somebody no, for but, a civil war. You know. But um, yeah, we did find we do find out that he cheated on her, and uh, they were having marital marital issues because of right, it. Right. Right. Which again, so I don't know, so much so much heartache would be just avoided if people just learned to communicate their needs. Sure. Sure. Like and and actually communicate their needs. Yeah. Um, 
there's a lot to be said for saying, hey, um, I want something that's physical and it's not in our relationship together right now, but I, I do want to be honest with you. I, there's so much that so much people could benefit just from that approach. Yeah. Just because some people As I don't example, think see it that if way. If I'm married to so and so, that doesn't mean I belong to so and so. Well, some people would beg to differ. And I'm not one of those people, but I'm saying I do know that there's a different point of view out there. Yeah. I don't I agree with it, but you know, it's I, I get where you're coming from. Anyway. Um so we're, we're But the cheating part wasn't something that I really held like, oh well, he's a cheater. I didn't think that no, it made him a I bad th- person. I think I think he made a mistake and he was trying to make up for it. Yeah. And again, he felt like that he really wasn't the the one messing up in the relationship at this point. That's why he didn't trust right. her. But also the um the alcohol with um with Kate was a little more dangerous because sure. she it had these consequences that were very serious. Sure. So um she was wrong. Right. And yeah. she did have yeah. to earn that back. And she didn't and she specifically at one point said, those are AA terms. I didn't go to AA. I just stopped drinking. Okay, but you need some kind of support system. It's great that you're going to a therapist, but you need something you need you need something to kind of make you commit to it you can't just say well i'm not drinking anymore yeah sometimes i guess you need something else extra just to make sure you stick with it but but um so dead the dad's dead now he gets he gets stabbed so many so many times she just sticks them over and over and over again all her aggression fucking what's it called max is watching at the Mm -hmm. top of the stairs Mm -hmm. so that's when esther sees that max is watching and then she's like i'm gonna fucking go kill you now yeah and um by this time, the mom's there, and oh, by this time, okay. the mom is driving home from the hospital, texting in the snow texting because and I driving. guess that's a thing white people do. Because we also saw that in a couple of other movies. This yeah, year. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I don't know. Maybe I just never lived in the snow. She was <laughs> trying her best to get there as fast as you can to and warn when him. She gets there. She runs into the house with the car. Yeah. Oh, right. She doesn't even fucking try to park in the drive. She's like, I'm going to go right through like, the I'm front door. Here. Bam. And into the living room. She gets there and she says, John is dead. <laughs> He's dead. And she's looking for Max yeah. because that's the only other person. For all she knows, Daniel might just be dead at the hospital. Yeah. Well, this she does do a good scene, I think, of I mean, her acting there. She always does um, a good acting. Right, right, right. She's great. But like she had to go through the experience of, oh, my God, my husband is dead in front of me. But then she had to snap out of that moment and be like, wait yeah. a minute, my child. It was great because she's like, oh, my God. And that that like, oh, my gosh. And then it was, I have to help him. And then it was the realization and then just, oh, my God. But then it was like, oh, my daughter. Like, uh, yeah. You know, so you, you did see that, com- that 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 transition. And, it, and she just does yeah. it so well. So she's already ca- also called 911. But obviously. Yeah. You know, on the way there, she called 911 says there's an intruder in right, my house. Yeah. Good which job. was smart. Yeah. Um, which is smart because at least they're getting on their way, right? Um, Max is very, very smart and she's hiding in a closet inside the laundry basket because sure. she's tiny. She's five. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and Vera, Vera, Kate is looking for her but can't find her because she's also, you know, hiding. Yeah. Um, but you know what happens to Kate? She gets shot. Shot, yeah. Esther... Heard obviously Kate drive this car through the front, uh, you know, living room window or whatever, and so she grabs the gun. It's like I'm gonna finish this bitch off. Mm-hmm. Um, now so the gun was in the safe that she had access to. She knew, right yeah, now. she knew where it was. Uh, she played Russian roulette with fucking uh, with Max with Max earlier on, yeah. Uh, so, anyways, she now has got the gun. She shoots Kate at uh, Kate through the uh, like. What, what what do you call so it? She, like the, no, she, uh, she shoots her and then she makes her way to the bathroom. She does a tourniquet, whatever. Right, she right, gets right, shot, right. She the gets first shot, shot multiple, multiple times. times. Yeah. But um, and then she crawls out of the bathroom window onto right. the roof. That's right. And that's where she starts walking above, like where the greenhouse is, and she sees Max. She sees Max has made her way into the greenhouse. Into the greenhouse, yeah. and she's hiding underneath some of the foliage. So, yes. Um. Esther, however, also has, or Esther slash Lena has also made her way in there. Right. And she's looking for her. So Kate is signing to, um, she's signing, signing to, her to, Ma- to Max, Max, telling her, stay hidden, stay hidden. 
Um, Esther is finding her. She's about to shoot her. And Kate, like, slams her way down into the greenhouse. Sure. I think she shoots the bullet. Yeah, she's through, shooting her, first, her. Yeah. And then the she second lands time on she top lands, of her. Yeah. Bam. So Kate grabs the gun, grabs Max, and they start running out into the snow. Yeah. And they run towards the lake. So. I was surprised that she didn't, like, take out the vengeance right there and grab the gun and be like, pow, bitch. I think you really have to have that in your heart to be able to do those things yeah. automatically. Like, you... you. She was. She slapped people, her in the hospital. So I thought the next level would be like, I'm going to fucking kill you if you really I try mean, to kill my kids. Yes, but at this point, maybe she thinks she's dead. Sure. Right? And also, maybe she's aware that her daughter is with her. And she doesn't want her daughter to see okay, that. Okay, yeah, sure, you know? sure. So she grabs her daughter, and takes they, off. And yeah, and then we hear sirens. Yes. The cops are finally coming, but right. they're not there yet. Right. Um, so it's kind of a slow scene where she's uh, – Kate – is running with her daughter through the woods towards the little pond. Yeah. And the cops get to the house. They go through the house. And then we finally see that they do see that there's the dead husband. But they also get to the place where Esther was. And there's she's gone. There. Yes. Right. So I don't remember how it happens. But there gets there's this fight between Esther and Kate on the pond. Yeah. And they um Well Kate um she gets Kate bum rushed. Yeah. That's what happened. Esther has already seen them when she must have been following them. And uh quick second there, I think they must have been paused or whatever. And so Esther comes running behind with the knife and tries to stab Kate and they go rolling down, and they fall onto the mm-hmm. ice, and then they start their little scuffle um in the ice. Yeah. Um, and then that's where Max grabs the gun mm-hmm. and basically aims and fires. Luckily doesn't hit, hit, them, hit anybody. Well, she doesn't hit anybody. She hits the ice and the ice cracks. Right. Causing both of them to fall. Yeah. Um, which, you know, th- then now there's this like underwater fight scene. Right. And uh, in yeah. The, in the frozen pond. Frozen pond. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Like how long can you survive under there? Anyway, well, they keep pulling each other down, pulling each other down. And then um, at one point, uh, Kate gets out. And Esther comes out holding her. Like, she comes out, too, and says, don't let me go, Mommy. But right. she has this knife behind, behind her, her back. Behind her back, yeah. She's still ready to fucking... And, and Vera goes, I'm not your Mommy. And I'm not your her, fucking I'm Mommy. I'm not your fucking... Pass the fucking potatoes. Yeah, pass the fucking potatoes. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm not I'm, your fucking Mommy or and some shit. And she her in the face, and she She, like, down. breaks her neck. Yeah. It's fucking... And Esther falls to the bottom of the lake. Um... And then basically end a movie. And then uh, the police show up. Yeah, they, they find but them by the pond. And we don't know if Daniel's alive. We know John is dead. Right, yeah. Um, so who got killed the fuck up? I was going to say John, but then it just became really sad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, we were, yeah. Because John what you're does saying. get killed the fuck up. Yeah. He gets stabbed multiple times, multiple by, times. by somebody he has grown to love as his child. Right, yeah. Someone that he was trying to like. He was caring about. He loved. Yeah. So. You know, um, it's hard not to fall in love with a child when you have to care for it. Sure. Absolutely. You know, and it's, it's, it's just really sad. I can't imagine. Right. The sadness of his death is just, it's not one to say, you know, not to joke around. Like, I know it's not real, but it's still, it's not. Sure. Like, I don't know. So. It was sad. Now, there's, we're at the end of the movie here. Um, they don't say it's based on a true story, but I found out after you, well, I, I found out, but you brought it up as well. There is some truth to this story. This is not well, just some made up fairy tale. It's not, there isn't this storyline. Sure. But there is, so I have this book, um, it's called The Curum Case and it's by Ryan something it's called the Cur- the Curum case okay um and it is a story of i think it was in i don't know it's like it was an eastern european oh, country okay. and there was there was um a man who on his baby monitor got the feed from another how another home and it was two boys naked and chained up in a room with no windows. Okay. It was somebody was monitoring them, but there was like a glitch in the feed. And so there was a police search in the area. 
And they finally got to the house of these two sisters. And the two sisters um, refused to give them access to a door okay. that was locked. Um, and at the same time, their girl, there, there was like another 10-year-old girl or something named Anna. Okay. Um, who, whenever they got to the door, she had this huge fit kind of distracting them a little bit, right? But the f- police finally got through and it found out that, I think Katarina was the name of the mother. Um, she had two sons and they were torturing them. Wow. And they were torturing them, but in like a very cult-like way, as in they would make them carve off some of the flesh and feed oh, it to each nasty. other kind of thing. Oh. And it was just really bad. Sure. But it turns out that this girl masquerading as, I want to say 10 or four, 10 to 14 years old. Okay. Um, was actually this grown ass woman. Okay. Like a, a 30 something year old woman. And um, let me see if I can find it. Now uh, this is all actually very interesting, but I had actually quickly looked and found something on Dr. Phil about a case like this, where this was an American uh, family who adopted, well, I don't know if they were, whatever. There was an yes, adoption. Uh, yes. Yeah. I saw that too. So there was another family who had this daughter who, but they were able to find it and it didn't end like this. Um, I don't remember their names, but um, she wasn't being sinister. She was just not trying to be an adult. Sure. I think that's what it was. Yeah. She, but it, she was saying that she was like either nine or 15, 16 mm-hmm. throughout the course of it when she was really like 33 or something like that. Right. Because they found that she had pubic hair and, mm. and such. So, yeah, that was very interesting. <laughs> uh, the reason why my mind went to the Kerm case was because I'm like a true crime aficionado. I yeah, think. yeah, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> but um, and but it, and, and it's an audio book. I had so every time I had to go to Chicago, I was always like, well, I yeah. mean, I have this. <laughs> yeah, but that's got to be crazy if you imagine like going through this process of adopting someone. You mm-hmm. think they're a child, and you find out that they're thirty three well, year olds. Also, a young something adult. like that. There was this girl named Gypsy Rose. Gypsy Rose. <laughs> yeah. And she was um she was a girl whose mother made her believe that she was um mentally impaired and chronically ill. So I guess it was a munchhound by proxy, whatever. Okay. But they told society that she was a child. In reality, she was like 20 something years old. Really? And her mother made her think she couldn't walk, but she could. So there was like this, there, there, this happens. Right. Yeah. Because there are, there are there, some issues that like, there are hormonal issues. You know, you tell me all the time, every time you see somebody, a grown ass man dating a, a woman that looks like a girl, you're like, that's weird. Yeah. I do find that to be a little bit strange. Like, even though the person is like an adult, but they have a very like young look. Right. Like, but- there's a case for there's a understanding of okay, but they're the the person that you're falling in love with, not their outer appearance. I guess but so, but you have to also be attracted to the outer appearance. Yeah, I understand though, not being able to see past that as well. Um, but you have to like like in Esther's case, like all purely fictional, right? But in Esther's case, I would say I understand. Um, that she would want to have that closeness, especially if she was abused as a child, because sure. that's how she equates affection and love sure. and caring, uh, which is why she tries to mate with the fathers. Right. R- right. Yeah. So it would be really good to um, to understand how to better support these women who do go through that, because there was I also saw something with what is the smallest woman in the world? Um, she also wants to have a boyfriend. She also wants to live this normal life of, of finding a partner. Oh, and, right. and you know what I mean? So you're so, talking about, like, is, is she like a tiny little Indian yeah, girl? Yeah, yeah. She's like, like a foot tall or so, yeah. something like that. It looks and, like a little And doll. these are all natural needs. They're, they're innate. Like we automatically as a species right. want to share our life with a partner or multiple partners, yeah, depending yeah, on where you're from. Right, right. But it's, um, there has to be a way to figure out how to help them meet those needs sure. without exposing them to people who are 
pedophiles. Well, but in this case, and they I'm wouldn't not be pedophiles to... if they were adults. But it's still that cringe factor, right? But if if they play, if they found out by playing her game and she was pretending to be young, then they're technically like pseudo pedophiles, right? Yeah, and yeah. It's, but essentially, that's would have solved would have solved this issue. She just needed to, to, to like, read the right man. Yeah, <laughs> that's you know. Yeah, I it, mean. The thing is that um, that condition that she had, what was it called? It was called hypopituitarism. Pituitary. Pituitar- hypopituitarism. There's an actual <laughs> treatment for that. Really? You need da- daily oh, they have medication. Oh, they supply like hormones or yeah. something. Like- oh, daily medication. Yeah, I did see something. And again, this is where they like – You know, people try to say, oh, well, it wouldn't have worked that way because of this. Usually I'm the one saying those kind of things Uh Um, that in real real life, this type of person would have had to take such regular medication that they would have had to, you know, like it would have exposed them. They would have been Mm -hmm. not been able to survive without having daily medication. Would that medication be for them to survive or for them to continue growing typically? Oh, right. I don't know. But. I think the what I read was it was more something that they would need for their own their own body. In other words, they're not supplying extra hormones to try to get them back to normal. They're supplying them with hormones Sufficient that just hormones to, to keep sustain them steady. Themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's scientifically lots of issues that we can come yeah. across, but ultimately, I did enjoy the movie, um, even though I had seen it before. Right. I, I love the scares. Yeah. I love the ang- the anxiety that I that I felt in certain areas. I hated the uncomfortable scene of her trying to seduce her dad. Yeah, that made me feel icky. It, yeah. Um, but all in all, apparently it was, a it good was movie. more graphic than that. Yeah, like obviously cut it or whatever, which yeah. <laughs> is a good thing. Yeah. Um, I remember not necessarily liking this movie the first time around, or not necessarily not liking it, but it just. It didn't resonate with me at the time. I remember watching it. It was like a filler thing. I was like, oh, I would just watch that movie. It was whatever. But I actually enjoyed it more this time. And I actually enjoyed it. I don't know. Because I forgot that Vera was in it. And I think that she's such a good actor. And again, like it was definitely a good role. Like like I said, that scene where she came in and had to see her, her – uh, husband dead on the floor yeah. like she really sells the emotion part of it and then like you said like having to recuperate and then regroup and then move forward it was yeah. like you know yeah. you saw it like yeah no it was she was great but i love her in pretty much anything she does sure um definitely it was it was a fun watch and i liked being able to break it down this time yeah. too yeah that was good so well, thanks for watching it with me. You're welcome. I'm so glad we're back at this. Yeah, feels good. Yeah. Um, thanks for joining us. We hope you liked Orphan. Uh, let us know your thoughts. Did we miss the mark? Did you feel like the movie sucked? Because I loved it. Yeah. What? Uh, let us know. What did you think? And what did we miss? Um, did we get some facts wrong or not? I don't know. It's Probably all good. Did. Probably. Just let us know. <laughs> Reach out. And uh, we'd be Have happy to hear from you. Have you adopted a thirty-three-year-old, fourteen-year-old? Let us know. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's a lot of. Um, oh my god! Women I want to who hear... have adopted by accident, like a thirty-three-year-old, no, a ten-year-old in the body of a thirty-three-year-old. <laughs> 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 my god, damn, this stupid, lazy motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys know the deal. We'll see you next time. See ya. Okay, bye.